Campaigners pressing for urgent action to reduce the destructive impact of carbon dioxide and other emissions on the environment have increasingly had aviation in their sights. The industry commonly defends itself with the claim that it only accounts for little more than 2% of all the carbon dioxide emissions caused by human activity. But the problem is that the industry's growth trajectory has long pointed to that proportion rising, in part as more concerted action is taken to cut emissions in other areas. But the question is, did 2020, the year that COVID turned our worlds upside down, change this equation? In January, Eurocontrol reported that while the number of flights in and out and within Europe dropped by a staggering 54%, the volume of emissions from aircraft was down by just 56.7%. And you might well have expected that that decline in emissions would be higher, especially since long-haul flights account for a much higher percentage of emissions, and it was the intercontinental flights that saw the biggest decline last year. Well, I'm glad to be joined again by my colleague, Kathy Buck, who's here with us from Brussels. And Kathy, I'm sure you're much better at mathematics than me. Um, so what do you make of the Eurocontrol figures? Um, hello, Charlie. I'm not so sure about my mathematical skills, but um, <laughs> you know, I look at the Eurocontrol figures and I would say there is some good news in these figures, but there's also some bad news. The good news is that the curve is going in the right direction. For example, when you look at the same set of data for 2019 compared to 2017, the number of flights in Europe rose on average 3.5%, and the increase in carbon dioxide emissions was 7.5%. So CO2 was faster than the increase in flights. Last year, the decrease in CO2 was higher than the decrease in traffic. So that's good. However, the bad news is that one would have expected, as you pointed out, the curve of CO2 reduction to be steeper because the industry has been implementing several measures to reduce their carbon footprint. So is it really the case that the radically changed traffic patterns that we've seen during COVID are actually responsible for, for changing some of, the, some of the emissions data that we might have expected to see? Now, Eurocontrol published a follow-up CO2 data snapshot, as you mentioned, in which it highlights the dominant role of local flights in airlines carbon production. Now, this is interesting from a policy perspective. There is a strong movement here in Europe, as you know, to blame the short-haul locust carriers for the pollution. Some even argue this flight should be scrapped all the way and replaced by other alternatives such as rail. However, these data show that the maximum possible savings in short haul is about 4% of the total CO2. Mm -hmm. So it would be better to look at other policy measures, for example, increasing supply of sustainable aviation fuel. If you cover just 10% of the needs of long haul with SAF, that would do more than ever can be done in short haul to reduce net CO2 emissions. Um, yeah. Interesting. Now, Charlie, you know, if traffic levels are going down, which we're seeing with COVID here, um, is that going to go and take a little bit of the pressure of aviation to get greener? I, I really don't think think so, Kathy. I mean, the truth is, it has been a crazy, you could say terrible 12 months for aviation, but the industry isn't off the hook, in my opinion, because I, let's be clear, COVID or no COVID, most responsible people in aviation don't want to dodge their responsibility. And almost worldwide now, countries are trying to stick to their commitments under the Paris Agreement. I mean, the United States now even is, is back with the Paris Agreement. And for aviation, that means striving to an ambitious commitment to be carbon free no later than 2050, if not sooner. And some of the key milestones for that are already, uh, you know, moving closer to us with bodies like ICAO and IATA and the European Union all leading the way. And the, I think really the aviation industry has to take the initiative. Because if it doesn't, if it's perceived to not be making progress and not really caring, then it could end up having measures imposed on it that it doesn't like, like new charges and taxes and restrictions. And so aviation needs to be seen to be part of the solution to avoid being treated as the problem itself. Uh, and so, yes, there's a big push, as you mentioned, uh, potentially to take a quantum leap in technology with aircraft powered by electricity and hydrogen. But that's, that's a long haul effort. It's not gonna happen soon. 
Um, and there are certainly shorter term measures in play, like sustainable aviation, which you also mentioned. So what do you think of sustainable aviation? Do you think that that's something that is going to start kicking in in terms of making a difference sooner? Well, sustainable aviation, or as we call it SAF, is mm. definitely seen as the holy grail for considerable reduction in aviation CO2 in the short term. Uh, the advantages of SAF are clear. The technology is there and proven. Its usage is certified for a blend of up to 50% with conventional fossil-based jet fuel. It can be used without any technical modifications to most in-service aircraft and engines. And it can be automatically incorporated into existing airport fueling systems. But it comes with its own set of challenges. And one is the cost. SAF is markedly more expensive than conventional jet fuel. IATA estimates the cost of SAF to be between two to seven times the cost of fossil kerosene. So the current COVID environment with low demand, low yields, and just low revenues for airlines is not exactly conducive to start purchasing more expensive fuel, which is already one of the largest cost items for airlines. Then there's the supply and demand issues. Airlines argue there's not sufficient supply of SAF to allow to tanker big quantities. SAF producers counter argue that airlines are not buying enough to allow for larger production. We know the discussion. Then there's the sustainability of the feedstock. Now, yeah. the European Commission, to speak about Europe, is aware of all these challenges and in the coming week is expected to publish a dedicated refuel EU proposal for aviation. It fits perfectly into the uh, EU Green Deal. It fits into the, the goals of the industry. And it will include several policy measures to support the commercial development and rollout of the whole spectrum of SAFs to ensure their large scale availability at a lower cost. I'm not saying at a lower cost, a lower mm -hmm. cost. So given everything that airlines are going through right now, Cathy, what do we think it would take to actually make it possible for airlines to refresh their fleets with new, more fuel efficient aircraft? And didn't Airbus CEO Guillaume Foray have some ideas on that? Well, not too many airlines are ordering new aircraft, and even more airlines are deferring the delivery of new aircraft ahead of the pre-COVID. Passengers are not flying, thus there is no need to enlarge the fleets. But you can always trust the manufacturers to come up with a solution to keep their business going. So, Fari last year found inspiration in the incentive scheme for the automotive industry, which was launched by the Obama administration in the wake of the financial crisis. So, crisis, crisis. Mm -hmm. um, so, the Airbus boss believes that the so-called cash for clunkers government-supported program could be transposed to aviation. Airlines mm -hmm. would receive a financial incentive to retire older, more polluting aircraft in favor for newer, greener jets. So at an online event here in Brussels last year, Fori described the initiative as a win for airlines, a win for the environment, and a win for the whole aerospace supply chain. Now, to be honest, Charlie, I'm not sure where it stands or who will finance this. National yeah. governments, the EU. Germany, in its federal COVID recovery budget, has allocated 1 billion euros for fleet renewal. Now, Germany is a so-called Airbus country. They have large Airbus assembly plants. So I can imagine they would be supportive for such a scheme. Now, Lufthansa has not exactly a lot of clunkers flying. And what right. is Angela Merkel you know, going to tell Lufthansa, you must buy Airbus aircraft? She could argue that if a scheme is financed by German taxpayers, it should favor a German manufacturer. But will yeah. this lead to yet another Airbus Boeing dispute in the WTO? I don't know. I guess this is what So it's, it's another example of, of an idea that, you know, sounds like such a good, simple idea. But when you actually start to think about how it could be implemented, there are, there are as you say, political complications like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I suppose the industry has to start somewhere, really. Yeah, yeah. And, and I understand, Cathy, just a week ago, barely a week ago, you attended um, one of many industry discussions. I, th I think this involved the uh, Airlines for Europe group, did it? Um, what, what came out of that? And, and did you hear anything that suggests the industry is, is kind of rethinking its approach to climate action? Yeah. So, you know, yep, Europe's main industry associations released an action plan to reach a net zero carbon emissions by 20. 
50 from all flights departing from what they call EU plus airports. So that is the EU, the 27 members of the EU, its former member, the UK, plus the four European free trade associations uh, countries. The main takeaway from this destination 2050 a route to net zero European aviation is that all segments of the industry are aligned on the level of ambition and on the roadmap to achieve the net zero goal. Airlines, airports, air traffic management providers and aerospace firms. So in other words, it's really across industry action plans, which is very good. Yeah, now, yeah. what I thought was really interesting is that the researchers acknowledge and calculate the effect of some measures on demand. You remember we mentioned before the SAF and the expense of SAF. So using sustainable aviation fuels could achieve an emissions reduction of 34%. That's a lot. Plus, those researchers say, an additional 12% due to reduced demand. Now, to conclude, Charlie... The aviation industry in Europe has come to terms that decarbonization is part of its license to grow. Now, since we're talking about the license to grow, do we have any idea what will happen to demand you know, for airline flights as COVID clears? Yeah, I think that's such a critical uh, question, Kathy, and it's so immediate because everything we've been talking about is, you know, progress that that is going to take at least a decade or more to achieve. And yet here we are facing, you know, what is, please God, a once in a lifetime special challenge like COVID. And I think the honest answer is nobody does have a clear idea of what will happen to demand as no. as we put COVID behind us. Uh, I've heard basically two theories uh, being being proposed by the industry and indeed people that I talk to. And one is that there could be incredible pent up demand for people who are desperate to start traveling again when they're allowed to do that. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're in that camp and possibly I am yeah. too. Uh, but then I've also heard, you know, consumers uh, saying, well, you know, maybe what they've experienced in COVID will change their attitude towards traveling. You know, maybe maybe yeah. it's given them time to rethink how and why they travel. For example, I've spoken to business people who, who basically have said to me, you know, I can't believe I used to make all those stupid business trips. I would I would travel almost every day of the week to just to go and have a one hour meeting with yeah. somebody two hours away. Why did I do that? I ruined my family life. It wasn't efficient. Yeah. So the, the the fact is there could be a change that is that is indirectly triggered from COVID. I can also say this again, Airbus's uh, CEO, Guillaume Forey, who, who you can be sure has, has spent a lot of time studying the market. Oh, um, yeah. In his conference, he said, you know, e even Airbus is pretty uncertain about this. I mean, basically, they're not even pretending they know what will happen this year in 2021. They hope that in 2022, things will start to look a little bit more normal. But even in their most optimistic expectations, they don't predict any significant return in demand until at least 2023, if not 2024 or 2025. Yeah. So, you know, we don't know for sure. So we've covered a lot of ground, Kathy. Um, you know, I, I think clearly the aviation is committed to making itself cleaner, but it's yeah. not a single track path. And, no. and obviously, uh, this is going to continue for some time. But yeah. uh, I promise you, next time we talk, we'll go over all that exciting uh, news from the world of electric aviation and hydrogen aviation. Okay, with pleasure. It sounds very interesting. Lots, lots of things happening in that field. Yeah, absolutely. You learn something yeah. every day there. Well, thank you very much for uh, discussing that with us, Kathy, And uh, thank you very much for watching, everybody. You know, thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching this AIN video. Please like, subscribe, and share it if you've enjoyed it. Also, visit AINonline.com for all the latest on the aviation industry.